some water. Hopefully that'll help me through the rest of uh, this evening. I'm grateful for uh, Brother Tidwell and for the great work that he's doing here. I'm grateful for this congregation and the influence that they have in this community. Uh, but larger than that, I mean, we see many people coming from areas all over the country, and I'm grateful to be coming uh, down uh, from Michigan to be with you here this evening. Uh, my topic, or my lesson, um, is on the, uh, on the topic of saving faith. Uh, when I was presented with this lesson, it's one of those, um, it's the material that is so broad in spectrum. There's so much you could talk about. There's so much that could be said about a saving faith. And so I'm going to try my best to kind of hone in on a few ideas as we think about what a saving faith, what a saving faith entails. Um, and, and as we think about, we come to this uh, idea of a saving faith, nothing is more essential Nothing is more fundamental, nothing is more crucial to the Christian than our faith. In, in times of, uh, of need, in times of despair, in times of joy, at all times in our life, we need to rely upon our faith. As we survey the Bible, both the Old Testament and the New, they're built around the theme which is the same, that the just shall live by faith Romans chapter 1 and verse 17. Uh, the most famous verse in the best-selling book year after year, John chapter 3 and verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him. Again, this idea, this, this theme is central to God's Word and should be central to our lives. Faith in God. In John chapter 8 and 24, Jesus taught, For unless you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Again, driving the reader back to knowing and asking the question, What is faith? What does it mean to believe? If we could put it simply, we would say that a saving faith is the acceptance of Jesus Christ as Lord and trusting Him en enough to do what He requires. This is easy to write down on, on paper, right? right? That we're going to accept Jesus Christ and we're going to trust Him and we're going to do what He requires. But what does that mean? How do we lay that out in our lives practically? Before we can do that, we have to really define uh, faith and belief as the Bible defines it. Thayer's Greek uh, English lexicon defines this word faith as we find it in, the, in our Bibles um, in three parts. For in the first part, it is a conviction that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In the second place, it is trusting Him as Lord. And third, it is obedience to His command. So conviction, trust, and obedience. Again, our topic, our, the, the theme of this lesson is a saving faith. And so how can we make this into an application? Well, we have to be convicted that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We have to trust Him as Lord, and we have to be obedient to His commands. These are straightforward, folks. This isn't, this isn't rocket science. This is straightforward material for us to learn, to know, to grow in, and hopefully to share with others. Faith involves every aspect of man. There isn't a part that we can reserve for something else. It, it, we have to be, as I often... Um, my hobby horse, I guess, maybe, is, is that we have to be all in. We can't just be halfway in. We can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. We have to be all in. And our faith is no different. We can't have a faith that is only active on Sundays and on Wednesdays or on special gatherings with other Christians. Our faith has to be an all-the-time faith. And it has to encompass every part of us. And, and we're going to notice, uh, as Alan Webster points out, Alan Webster is a great writer in the Lord's Church, and, and he writes, the three elements of personality are involved in coming to possess biblical faith and becoming a Christian. This saving faith it involves our intellect, it involves our emotions, and it involves the will of man. And that's going to really be our three points this evening as we think about, as we drive home uh, the idea of, uh, of answering the question, what is a saving faith? What is a saving faith? How can it be defined? How can we recognize what it is? How can we teach others about what a saving faith is? And maybe there are some here this evening we might ask ourselves, I want to have a deeper faith. How do I do that? How do I do that? 
And, and, and it's not just read your Bible more. There's more, there's more to it than, than just that. So how can I have a, a, a saving faith or how can I teach others about having a saving faith? Where does having a saving faith begin? Where do I even start in this process of having a saving faith? Well, first, uh, again, not to demean um, uh, knowing God's Word. That's the first point. We have to know the Word of God. We have to understand what God's Word is. And so it begins with a conviction that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It, it begins with man's intellect, with, it, with, with, with the thinking, with the, 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 the rational, the, 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 the logical. Having a saving faith begins with the conviction that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You ask yourself, do you want to build a rock-solid faith? Then you must build it on the intellect of mankind. If you want to build your faith or if you want to build the faith of, of someone, you have to build it upon their intellect because that is where conviction and that is where passion is found is in the intellect. If we know something, we can build from there. If we're convicted about something, about some truth, we can build from there. Faith involves coming to a possession of some basic facts about the eternal God and about Jesus Christ, His Son, and also the gospel that Jesus Christ brought forth. But these truths are not, again, as I stated before, these truths are not complicated. Right? And the things I'm going to bring up tonight, you're not going to say, wow, Freddie, I've never heard that before. These are things that we've heard time and time again, but are we, as this first point uh, uh, points out, are, are we convicted in these things? Are we convicted in our lives in the way that we're living, the way that we're acting, the way that we're speaking? And so we must be convicted that there is a God. We must be convicted that there is a God. Sometimes in our Bible studies, we skim on past that point. Well, we accept everybody knows that there is a God. But there might be many, some that have been in the church the, 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 their whole lives. And yet they, they still have questions about who God is and, and what that means that He exists. So we must have a basic understanding. If we want to have conviction, if we want to have a saving faith, we have to have a, a, a basic conviction about who God is. Because before we can ever believe or teach or learn about the Son of God, we have to know about God. Who is God? Scripture says that, and without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he who comes to God must first believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who seek Him. We're oftentimes ready to jump on the train of the rewards for those who seek Him, but not ready to accept who God says He is. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And so we must believe in God's existence, in God's benevolent character, that He loves those uh, that seek Him. And there's many good reasons to believe in God. Uh, we just had uh, a few months ago a, uh, the, the Warren Christian Apologetics put on a, a, a debate uh, between an atheist and uh, and a Christian, and and it was a great it was a great debate, and it helped many Christians to really ponder why is it that I believe in God, why do I believe that He exists? We have so much evidence that points to the fact that God does exist. We have the cosmological argument, the the fine tuning argument, the moral laws argument, the testimony of Scripture. Over and over and over again, we have many uh, evidences that point to God exists. God exists. And, and one time, when I speak to the young folks at Southside or, or wherever I go, uh, I, I, I want to um, emphasize to them when, when we say, how do you know the, the Bible to be true? And this is a side point, I guess, but how do you know the Bible to be true? Don't tell me because it says it's true. Don't tell me that. Tell me the Bible's true because of the evidence that's presented to show us that the Bible's true. And the same is true for God. Don't say, well, you just have to have faith that God's real. No, show me. Show me. Give me evidence 
Again, going back to, 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 uh, to, to Hebrews 11, verse 6, and without faith, it's, it, it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is. Why? Why do you believe that he is? Where is your evidence? Pointing out this evidence is not just a good place to start, especially as, we're, as many of you are engaged in personal Bible studies. It's not just a good place to start. It should be the place to start. When, you, when you're confronted with someone who says, uh, you know, I, I don't have any familiarity with the church and, and I don't necessarily believe that there is a God, start with, uh, with helping them to understand that God does exist and that there are many arguments that prove his existence. It's easy for, uh, for, for men and women alike to, to lose interest when the big picture has not been established in their minds. And, and likewise, it's easy for Christians to lose interest when they really haven't grasped the big picture. What I mean by the big picture? That God exists and we are living in His creation. Imagine how, how disinterested you would become if, if you never saw the, the, uh, the, the picture on the box of the 5,000-piece puzzle. And someone just handed you piece by piece by piece and said, that goes there, that goes there, that goes there. And maybe through a little bit of time, you would see some things coming together. But how it would be so easy to lose interest very early on. We have the big picture in front of us. But are we doing our due diligence to study those things and to show ourselves approved? When we are asking ourselves, what is a saving faith? A saving faith begins with a conviction that Jesus Christ is a son of God. We have to know who God is to know who Jesus Christ, his son, is. And we need to know more than just the fact that Jesus Christ existed. We have to know details about his life, about his death, his teachings, the miracles, his, his moral character. His death, his burial, his resurrection, to be fully convicted of who he is. I've, I've worked with young folks for some time in, in, in different congregations. <coughs> and many young folks are acquainted with Jesus. But, but I'll tell you the truth, there aren't many that are convicted of who he is. There are many young folks that are acquainted. I know who Jesus is, and I know the things that he's done, but they're not convicted in their hearts and in their minds, intellectually, of who Jesus was. Do we realize the rock-solid case? I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but do we realize the rock-solid case of, uh, of the gospel, of the death, burial, and resurrection? And how often do we, we emphasize that to our young people? That, the, rock, the, that the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is a rock-solid closed case. We present that to them as evidence, allowing them to see that, that Jesus Christ really did come to earth. That he really did live among us. When those young folks realize and are finally convicted of who Jesus Christ is, you see a light bulb go off. And how amazing that is. They realize who Jesus is. They realize what Jesus did for them. And they're ready at that point. Many of them are ready to, to, to shed uh, their worldly ways, their worldly skin, and, and start working for him and building up his kingdom. And the knowledge of Jesus Christ is only going to come by studying the word of God, especially the gospel accounts. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says, So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. How do we want to build our faith? Again, let's not ever neglect, let's never demean studying God's word. But as we're going to get to in the future, it's also a putting into action what the word of God has to say. Just like the Pentateuch was the basis for the, for the old law and for the Old Testament, so too the, 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 the gospel accounts lay a foundation for the Christian. If, we don't, if we're not, not just familiar, if we don't know what happened in Jesus' life and who Jesus was, uh, then how can we truly be convicted of the life that Jesus lived? And thereby try to emulate, try to, try to uh, remanufacture in our lives a life that looks like Jesus. John records the words of Jesus. He says, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son, John chapter 3 and verse 18. 
And so we want to have a saving faith. We want others to have that saving faith. It begins with conviction. It begins with conviction that, that there is a God and that, he, that, and that God sent His Son, uh, a, a man, fully man and fully God, to earth to come and, and die for our sins. Do we, uh, do we understand uh, the gospel of Christ? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, we, Paul recounts that gospel, that it is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. On the eve of returning to heaven, Jesus said uh, in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Believing, having faith is important. And Jesus had just recounted, uh, 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 the, the gospel had just been recorded of Jesus' death, his burial, and his resurrection. As we learn about the gospel, we'll also notice what else begins with the preaching of the gospel? The church. To have a, 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 have a, a saving faith, we must be convicted uh, of who God is and who He says He is, and Jesus Christ His Son, and uh, of the gospel of Christ. And all we need to know about this gospel is found in one book. Well, you don't have to go through or, or, or own a library full of documents and books, we can go to the Word of God and we can understand what the Bible says about the Gospel of Christ. I'm speaking to many of you here tonight that, that know these things well, but I want you to ask yourselves, am I convicted about these things? But the definition of conviction is a strong persuasion or belief. When we have a strong persuasion or belief about anything, are we not moved to act in accord with that persuasion or that belief? How can we ever then stop when it comes to the Word of God? When it comes to knowing about who God is and, and who Jesus Christ uh, is and, and the gospel that He has presented us with? How can we stop in our conviction as we're striving to live lives in accordance with the Word of God? And so having a saving faith begins with a conviction that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It begins with man's intellect and knowing these things and then building upon that. But, but it's not just our, our intellect. As we look at the second point this evening, having a saving faith means also that we must trust Jesus for our salvation. Ellen Trueblood wrote, Faith is not belief without proof, but trust without reservation. Faith requires, it, it is, uh, it is uh, a precedent that uh, faith uh, has an emotional commitment as well as an intellectual. Some, I uh, come from the Baptist denomination, and many denominations ascribe to, to a, an emotions-only doctrine where the Word of God is just a bunch of good ideas. But, but by and large, um, it is based upon how you feel things ought to be done, how you feel you ought to worship God, how you feel you ought to live a Christian life. This is not what we're teaching here tonight. We have to have an, intellect, an intellectual base for our belief system. It has to come by knowing what God's Word says. But then we have to build upon that an emotional aspect. And that emotional aspect is trusting in the fact that, that, that Jesus Christ has laid out a plan of salvation and we can trust that plan to save us. And you say, well, who doesn't trust that? Ask, ask the individual that is so steeped in guilt over the sin that they lived their life. They said, I, I've lived my life in, in so much sin. How can God save me? I read what it says. I understand what it says. But how can God save me? I've been a sinner my whole life. Right? That's, that's not an intellectual problem. That is a trust issue. That is, that is an emotional breakdown that that person has between what God says he's going to do and their ability to trust what God says he can do. But even more so, we might think of uh, another example. Maybe some of you have been to the Grand Canyon. I've never been, wanted to go. Maybe I'll go one day. I have kids now, so maybe that'll make it possible. Um, and at the Grand Canyon, I've read about and I've seen pictures of this place called the Skywalk. And the Skywalk is a, 
uh, is a half arc um, uh, platform that uh, people can walk on and, uh, and, and from what I've read about it, um, the end of that skywalk um, uh, can hold 71 million pounds. That's how strong this, this, this half moon type bridge um, uh, structure uh, that's how strong it is, and, and, and this. Th what's unique about this is that it's made. Uh, the structure is made at least partially of glass, and so as you're walking on the skywalk, you can look down almost a thousand feet as you're hanging in the middle or or, or jutted out into the Grand Canyon. Now. What does that have to do with, with a saving faith? Well, as we think about this idea of, of trusting what God has said he's going to do, what Jesus Christ uh, has promised uh, salvation for those uh, that are obedient to his will, um, notice this, that you can look at all the facts about that skywalk about how much weight it can hold and, and the amount of time the engineers spent. Um, and that's the intellectual part, right? You have that on paper, you see that to be true. But then there comes an emotional aspect and that emotional aspect is you trusting that bridge to hold you. That bridge to hold you. Because maybe you say, maybe I'm the one person or the final person that steps foot onto the skywalk and it crushes and I die. The intellectual part says, well, all, all, everything on paper says that I'm insignificant. 71 million pounds, I weigh less than 200, and I walk on the skywalk, no big deal, right? And, and, and so the intellectual part says, no big deal, but, but the emotional part says, but I could die. I, I don't know if I trust the skywalk to do just what on paper it says it can do. Folks, this is no different than, 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 than trusting what Jesus Christ says that he will do for us if we're obedient to him. He will offer us salvation. We can have salvation full and free if we trust Jesus, if we trust him. Now, even on paper, we say, well, well I understand all those things I need to do. But even if I do those things, am I really truly saved? Do I really truly have salvation? Maybe, maybe you know someone, or maybe you're here tonight thinking that same thing. You say, you know, I, I know what it says on paper, but I'm just not fully convinced that that's what, uh, that's what Jesus is going to do for me. How sad it is when, when uh, a faithful member of the Lord's church um, it lies on their deathbed, and I'm not in that position, but they lie, they lie on their deathbed and they're scared, and you, and you ask them why, and they say, well, I'm just not sure about my salvation. But well, have you lived unfaithfully? No. No. Uh, um, is there something that you need to repent of? No. No, I'm just not sure. Again, that's the trust issue that, that is broken down, and it's an emotional aspect uh, that individuals have uh, not defined um, as they are striving forward, trying to have a saving faith. A saving faith includes a conviction, but it also includes trusting that Jesus said, is going to do what he says he's going to do. The, the Bible defines faith as... The Bible defines faith as... Now, the, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. And, and if we put all these things together, we can see that faith involves... Assurance based upon evidence and substance producing conviction. Faith is conviction paired with trust. It's conviction paired with trust. Because intellectual faith alone is not going to save us. Just knowing what the Bible says is not going to save us. We have to, uh, not be, and, and not jumping the gun uh, of obedience, we have to trust what the Word of God says. We have to trust what God's Word says uh, it's going to do for us. Some mentally consent that Jesus uh, of Nazareth lived, and they even allow that He is the Son of God. Listen to this, and notice, don't miss this point. But some, even though they admit to all of those things about Jesus Christ and who He was, they never trusted in Him or His words. There was a breakdown. They, they, they saw the things that, that Jesus said he was going to do for them, and they didn't trust that he would do these things for them. There was a breakdown of trust in God. 
James chapter 2 and verse 19 tells us that, that Satan believes in God, but we know we're not going to find him in heaven. Again, there, there is a conviction. He knows that God is real. Satan knows that God is real, but, but there is a breakdown. We can believe in many things, but our, our trust in Christ must surpass them all. Surpass them all. Sadly, this aspect of our saving faith um, is lost among the conviction and as we're going to get to the, the obedience. Sometimes the trust part of this saving faith is lost. Uh, we, we realize what God's word says and then we say, well, now we're going to do it. We have to also focus sometimes, I think, on developing individuals' trust. Individuals' trust in, in God and in, in what God says he's going to do um, for them and, and to them. If our emotional condition is in any way wanting, uh, it, 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 our faith condition is wanting in an emotional level, um, then our trust is going to dry up. And if our trust is gone, so too will our obedience follow. Saving faith includes a conviction uh, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and it, it includes a trust uh, uh, that we trust Jesus for salvation. And finally, um, it, uh, saving faith concludes in obedience. And I think this is oftentimes what we think about most when we think about faith. Um, faith is, is obedience. That is true. It is, it is a fact that, that faith includes obedience, but is not only obedience. Let's not forget about the prior two points of conviction and, and of trust. Faith concludes in obedience of our will to God's will. Faith must be mixed before it can set. And, and scripture tells us in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 2, For indeed we have had good news preached to us, just as they also, but the word they heard did not profit them, because it was not united. Notice, it was not united by faith in those who heard. It wasn't united in faith. And so, not only are those that hear the word of God, but it must be united in obedience, in our will, followed through. A.W. Trozer wrote, The Bible recognizes no faith that does not lead to obedience, nor does it recognize any obedience that does not spring from faith. The two are opposite sides of the same coin. So a saving faith is one, uh, a saving faith is a faith that is surrendering. It's surrendering to what? It's surrendering to, to the will of God. Notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians 1, verses 7 through 10. Paul writing here to the church of Corinth, he says, and, and our hope is, excuse me, and our hope for you is firmly grounded, knowing that as you are sharers of our suffering, so also you are sharers of our conflict. For we do not want you to be unaware, brethren, of our affliction, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despised even our life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great, so great a peril of death, and will deliver us. He, who, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. Are we truly, as Christians, as those that are trying to follow the will of God, are we truly surrendering ourselves? We started out with the first point of, of having a true conviction of who God was, uh, who God is, and, and following that with trust in who God is. But are we willing to be obedient? Meaning, are we willing to surrender ourselves to God. And it is among the many paradoxes uh, that God's word poses for us. It's a paradox. It is, it is, the world tells us when you're trying to find something, you don't give up anything. When we're trying to find salvation, we must, we have to surrender ourselves to the will of God. You see, it's only when we surrender ourselves to God that we can be saved. Notice in Acts chapter 26, verse 20, 27 and 28, that King Agrippa believed, but he did not surrender, and, and so thereby he was not a Christian. 
Some rulers believed in John chapter 12, verse 42 and 43. And they believed on the Lord, but they denied him, so they were not saved. Again, it is this, I understand what it is on paper, but I'm not willing to be obedient, nor much less trust who God says he is. Paul said that the faith that avails, the, 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 the faith that continues, is the one that works through love. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. Notice, it is one that is working through love. Obedient, paired with trust and conviction. Uh, a, a writer and, and, and continual uh, faithful member of the Lord's Church, Wayne Jackson, pointed out in, in his commentary on Isaiah, he said, God does not require us to fix our mess. He requires us to finally give up and give in to his way. And, the me and then the mess will then fix itself. It will fix itself because we are obedient and we will do whatever is necessary to continue in a right relationship with God. So is our faith valid? Sitting here this evening, ask yourself, is my faith valid in the eyes of God? Well, our faith is only valid and will only continue to be valid as it is responding to God and what He requires. Nothing less. Nothing less will, will, will make our faith valid. It, it will invalidate our faith as soon as we say, I want to do this my way. Whatever that might be, I want to live my life my way versus the way God would want me to live. James wrote in James chapter 2 and verse 18, but some of them may well say, you have faith and I have work. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. I will show you my faith by my works. And there are two different views that are sometimes expressed on faith and it is important for us to, to understand and subscribe to the accurate of these two. Notice these two statements. Think for yourselves as we go through these two statements. First, a person can only be saved by faith or believing. Or two, a person is saved by faith only. Let me say those to you. There, there, there's one correct and there's one incorrect. Let me, let me say those one more time. A person can only be saved by faith and believing or a person is saved by faith only. These are two very different ideas because the, the, the first accurately teaches... What the scripture says, that, that, no one, that, that one is justified by faith, Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. And the second does not teach accurately. It says that once uh, one is saved, not by faith only, James chapter 2 and verse 24. Having a saving faith is, is as simple but as dynamic as having a conviction of who Jesus Christ is. Trusting and what he says, and being obedient in our will to his. It involves our intellect, it involves uh, thinking and rationale in our minds, but it also encompasses a, a portion of our emotions, trusting what God says he's going to do, and finally, it is an action of our will um, in, that, in, in the direction that God would want us to go. If we're focusing on one part of this equation and forgetting the others, we're missing something very great. And that could be anything. We could be just focusing on the obedience part, but forgetting to continually live convicted lives. Convicted lives that are trusting God. Again, Alan Webster um, gives a great uh, illustration as we tie all three of these aspects of a faith, saving faith together as we conclude the lesson. He says uh, this saving faith is like getting married. Boy meets girl. Boy likes girl. Girl likes boy. Each thinks I could spend the rest of my life with him or her. There is a spark. They are emotionally connect connected but intellectually they wonder. Are we compatible? So they agree to date, and then, another, and then another, and eventually decide to see each other only. The more they are together, the closer they become. The intellect and the emotions both now conclude, this is the one. Are they married? No. For the final vote, the will remains to be cast. 
Each entertains the idea of being married to this person, but wonders, am I ready? Uh, am I really ready to settle down? What if some, someone else comes along? Can I be a good spouse? Ultimately, the will decides, I am ready for a commitment. I cannot live without this very special person. A proposal is offered and accepted. A de date is set. A document is signed. A wedding is concluded. They are married. And so, as we see in this illustration, uh, a coming together of, uh, of conviction, of emotion, and of the will, so too is true about our faith. It has to be a coming together of our conviction, of our trust in God, and our will to follow Him in obedience. Will we have a saving faith? Will we have one that is based on conviction, trust, and obedience? The question is up to you. And I pray that you think about it, consider it as we go through the next series of these lessons speaking about what faith truly is. Thank you so much for your kind attention. We're going to have a, uh, a break now, but as we do, I'd like to ask Roy Johnson to come and to word a prayer for us. And then we will be gathering back together probably a few moments early.